Uh, pursuant to the motion adopted on January 31st, the committee is meeting on the situation at the Russia-Ukraine border and the implications for peace and security. Uh, I would like to outline a few rules to follow. Um, first, uh, please note that screenshots or taking photographs of your screens uh, is not permitted. Uh, les députés et les témoins on le... Members and witnesses uh, have the right to speak in the official language of their choice. Interpretation services are available for this meeting. You have the choice at the bottom of your screen of either floor English or French. If interpretation is lost, please inform me immediately. Participating in person, please keep in mind that the Board of Internal Economy guidelines for mask use and health protocols are in place. And as chair, I will be enforcing these measures for the duration of the meeting. And I thank you in advance for your cooperation. Uh, before speaking, please wait until I recognize you by name. And when speaking, please speak slowly and clearly. And when you're not speaking, uh, please ensure that your microphone is on mute. Uh, and just a reminder to members and witnesses that uh, comments should be addressed through the chair. Uh, just before we go to our first panel, uh, following on Mr. Morantz's uh, uh, comments earlier, I just want to verify briefly uh, that it's the consensus of members that we extend the witness deadline for the Taiwan and vaccine equity studies uh, that is currently slated for this Friday uh, by two weeks to February 25th. Do we have unanimous consent uh, from members on that to change? Any opposition? Okay, seeing none, we've approved that change. And I would now like to welcome our witnesses for the first panel. We have from Disinfo Watch, Mr. Marcos Kolga, Director from the Ukrainian Canadian Congress, Ihor Mikhailchishin, Executive Director and CEO, and from Hermitage Capital Management, William Browder, who's also the head of the Global Magnitsky Campaign. Each of you will have five minutes for your opening remarks. And the way it's worked well in the past to enforce this is to give you a 30 second warning in a very analog fashion through this yellow card. When you see this come up, you have 30 seconds to wrap up your comments. And that also goes for the question and answer period following. Um, without further ado, I would now like to turn the floor over to Mr. Kolga for his opening remarks uh, for five minutes. Mr. Kolga, the floor is yours. Please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, distinguished members of the committee, I'd like to speak to you today about the threat of Russian influence and in information operations known more broadly as cognitive warfare, and how Canada and our interests are targeted in the context of the crisis in Ukraine. Uh, Mr. Chairman, earlier this week, a Toronto bakery owned by a Ukrainian-Canadian family was vandalized with graffiti messages that said, F Ukraine and Canada and Russia's power. Police are currently investigating what seems to be a hate-based crime, but the messaging spray painted on the walls of the future bakery is consistent with anti-Ukrainian narratives promoted by Russian state media. Such attacks are the product of the Kremlin's cognitive warfare against Ukraine and more broadly, the community of Western democracies. Over the past six months, the Russian government's escalating tensions against Ukraine and NATO have been accompanied by an intensification of information warfare by Russian state media and the Kremlin's supporters and proxies here in Canada. The same false Russian state narratives that emerged during the Kremlin's 2014 invasion of Crimea and eastern Ukraine have re-emerged in efforts to undermine Canadian and allied support for Ukraine. Among these toxic narratives is that Canada's foreign policy is controlled by Ukrainian and Central and Eastern European diaspora groups. Conspiracy, sorry, conspiracy theories like this one have been deployed by extremists in the past to marginalize and silence other minority groups. Such conspiracy narratives threaten to delegitimize the status of Canadians of, of Ukrainian heritage by relegating their voices to a second lower tier of citizen, one whose voice isn't considered equal to other Canadians. The muting of this community in Canadian public discourse is precisely the outcome that Vladimir Putin seeks to achieve. Bill Browder, who you'll hear from in a moment, is a constant target of Russian state disinformation. A, re a recent Russian television segment suggested that he masterminded the recent uprising in Kazakhstan. And while he was advocating for Canadian Magnitsky human rights legislation in 2016, Russian state media accused Mr. Browder of being a CIA agent in a twisted documentary dedicated to discrediting him and other Russian anti-corruption activists like Alexei Navalny. The discrediting of critics by smearing them with false labels is a Soviet-era tactic that has been resurrected by Vladimir Putin. During the Cold War, Soviet officials indiscriminately labeled those who resisted Soviet repression and occupation as fascists and Nazi sympathizers, a tactic re reactivated by the Kremlin to discredit Ukrainian pro-democracy supporters and the Ukrainian community in Canada. Last week, a member of Canada's parliament sent out a tweet repeating this claim, stating that Canada's recent announcement of a $120 million loan to Ukraine would go to a government run by quote-unquote neo-Nazi militia. This is disinformation. 
Ukraine's government is, of course, democratically elected, and its president is a member of the Ukrainian Jewish community. It's worth noting that the Russian government has directly funded extremist parties like the National Front in France, the League in Italy, Jobbik in Hungary, in Austria, and other groups. In the broader geopolitical context, Russian state narratives seek to undermine Canadian confidence in NATO and through that erode cohesion within the transatlantic alliance. These include false claims about a, about a NATO commitment to reject the membership applications of Eastern and Central European nations in the 1990s. That false claim has been debunked by Mikhail Gorbachev, but is being used by Vladimir Putin as a pretext for his current escalation against Ukraine. Russian government disinformation narratives are often communicated through Russian state media channels that broadcast on Canadian-owned and controlled cable and satellite television systems. According to a 2017 report, Russia Today, known as RT, pays Canadian cable providers to carry their channel as part of their cable packages, delivering Russian disinformation into 7 million Canadian households. During the COVID pandemic, RT and Kremlin-aligned proxies operating inside Russia's disinformation ecosystem have promoted narratives that undermine trust in Western vaccines. They promote protests against government COVID protocols as righteous acts of civil disobedience. Indeed, even the Russian embassy in Canada directly promoted hesitancy towards Western vaccines on its website. Let me be very clear, the Kremlin's cognitive warfare does not genuinely share any ideology with any Canadian political party or movement. They exploit them. The pandemic has provided an opportunity through which the Russian government can manipulate Western societies and the tensions within them through conspiracy theories and anti-government narratives. The protests in Ottawa are no exception. They are also the targets of Russian state media platforms and their proxies. The concerns and emotions of Canadians who genuinely feel marginalized by COVID mandates are being exploited to further erode their trust in our governments, media, and their fellow Canadians. According to a 2021 Facebook report, Russia is the largest producer of disinformation on its platform. There are measures we can take to help support, to support Ukrainian sovereignty and protect our democracy at the same time. This includes targeting Vladimir Putin's own wealth and the corrupt oligarchs who support and hold Putin's assets abroad, including the hundreds of millions stashed away in plain sight right here in Canada. A task force should also be created to develop a cognitive national cognitive defense strategy to help all Canadians understand and recognize the threat of foreign influence and information operations and to provide resources to defend our democracy against them. Thank you very much. I look forward to your questions. Mr. Kolga, thank you very much. And thank you for sticking very closely to the time limit. I will now turn the floor over to Mr. Mikhail Tuchin for five minutes of opening remarks. Uh, please go ahead, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the invitation to appear here. Uh, as as the, this committee knows, the Ukrainian Canadian Congress is the Federation of Ukrainian Canadian Organizations here in Canada. Uh, we speak on behalf of the community of 1.4 million. We're looking forward to that census number and hoping it'll be even larger. Uh, so I am here to talk to you today about the Ukraine and Russia uh, security crisis. So as you know, in February 2014, uh, Russia invaded Ukraine and since then, has occupied Crimea, parts of the Eastern Ukraine oblasts of Donetsk, Luhansk, has continued to fuel a war in Eastern Ukraine where over 13,000 people have been killed, 30,000 wounded, and 1.5 million internally displaced within Ukraine. In November of 2021, Russia has once again started to intensify troop movements near Ukraine's borders, a series of di diplomatic discussions between the United States, NATO, EU states, Ukraine and Russia have not yielded any concrete results or commitments from Russia to de-escalate aggression against Ukraine. The UCC and our community believe strongly that now is the time for Canada to act further to deter Russian invasion rather than wait for this invasion to happen. The most effective way we believe to deter a further Russian invasion is to take proactive rather than reactive steps. We welcome the extension and expansion of Operation Unifier, Canada's military training mission in Ukraine announced by the government on January 26th. In the long run, the extension and expansion of this mission will critically strengthen Ukraine's defenses. However, the threat of a Russian invasion grows every day and the Ukrainian armed forces need our assistance further today. There are more than a dozen countries, including NATO allies of Canada's, which are supplying defensive weapons to Ukraine's armed forces in response to Russia's recent escalation of aggression and threats against Ukraine. The threat of, of invasion is severe, and Russia stands ready to invade at any time. Ukrainians are not asking anyone to fight for them, but they do need our help to defend their country against a colonial power seeking to reestablish its dominance. We know the government of Ukraine has requested such assistance from the government of Canada for defensive weapons. Uh, 
Second, sanctions, we believe, will deprive the Russian state of revenue from which to continue to wage war and will reinforce the message to the Russian government that the West is resolute in countering Russian aggression. The UCC urges the Foreign Affairs Committee to support further provision of defensive weapons and stronger sanctioning against Russia and its officials. We've conducted a public opinion poll, which we shared with, with members of parliament from January 20th and 21st, that shows three in four Canadians support or are open to supporting Canada providing defensive weapons to Ukraine. The number of Canadians, uh, who, which is 42%, ex who explicitly support the provision of weapons outnumbers the number of Canadians who oppose at 23%. The provision of weapons by almost two to one. As you've seen this past weekend, weekend across Canada, Canadians from the Ukrainian community in some 30 communities in all 10 provinces came together to demonstrate their support for Ukraine and for Canada to provide defensive weapons. From St. John's to Victoria, Canadians strongly supported this campaign and it is incomprehensible to us why the Canadian government continues to refuse to join our NATO allies in this important step to support Ukrainian independence. A survey published on February 9th by the European Council on Foreign Relations found also that the citizens of Europe uh, see NATO as the best organization, best position to defend Ukraine. 62% of respondents stated that NATO should come to the assistance of Ukraine if Russia were to invade. So just to sum up, uh, I know that our next speaker will talk more about sanctions, but we believe, again, the implementation of stronger sanctions against Russia will have two effects, deprive the Russian state of revenue from which to continue to wage war, and reinforce the message to the Russian government that the West is resolute in countering Russian aggression. Personal sanctions must be broadened against Russian officials responsible for egregious human rights violations of Ukrainian citizens, and Canada should target oligarchs that are close to the Russian regime, wealthy business people who serve as Putin's regime's enablers and who have significant assets in the West. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mikhail Tuchin, and thank you also for sticking uh, closely to the time limit. In fact, you're slightly under five minutes. Um, I will now turn the floor over to Mr. Browder again for five minutes of opening remarks. Uh, please go ahead. The floor is yours, sir. Uh, thank you very much for, for this opportunity <clears throat> to address you um, this afternoon on the uh, horrible situation um, in Ukraine. The, um, <clears throat> I'm here to talk about sanctions specifically. And as some of you know, I am the person behind the Magnitsky Act. Uh, Sergei Magnitsky was my lawyer in Russia who was murdered on November 16, 2009. And after his murder, I was looking for a way in which to um, seek justice for him. The idea um, came about because there were no other ways of, of um, finding redress. And we came up with this idea of, of freezing the assets and banning the travel of the people who were responsible for his murder. I first took this idea to the United States and in a, a true, truly bipartisan way, the Magnitsky Act was passed um, in 2012 with a vote of 92 to four in the Senate and 89% of the House of Representatives. It became a law on, February, on um, December 14, 2012. And Vladimir Putin went out of his mind when, um, when this law was passed. In, in retaliation, he banned the adoption of Russian orphans by American families. And then he, after that, he put Sergei Magnitsky on trial in the first ever trial against a dead man in Russian history and put me on trial as Sergei's co-defendant. We were both found guilty, Sergei, they couldn't do anything more to, um, but they sentenced me to nine years in absentia and have been chasing me around the world ever since. They've issued eight Interpol arrest warrants for me. Uh, they've gone to the British government on numerous occasions for my extradition. They've made death threats and various other things. And it's become a, a full-time job for a number of people in the Russian government to come after me. So we know with the Magnitsky Act that we've hit a nerve. We know that we've we found something that they really care about. In fact, a, a, a nerve probably greater than any other nerves, Putin declared it his single largest foreign policy priority to repeal the Magnitsky Act and prevent it from spreading around the world. Why does Putin care about this so much? He cares about it because um, Putin is a kleptocrat who's stolen an enormous amount of money from the Russian people, from the Russian state, and from Russian oligarchs. <clears throat> he's probably, he, he, I would estimate he's worth uh, $200 billion, um, but none of this money is kept in his own name. The money is kept in the name of, of people he trusts, 
I describe them as oligarch trustees. <clears throat> and so as we're looking around at this Ukrainian situation, and everybody is, is, is that there's so many different conversations going on to say, what do we do to stop Vladimir Putin from invading Ukraine? And the one thing I can say is that we should come up with something that he cares about. And we know what he cares about. He cares about his money and he cares about his money that are, that's held through these trustees. And so as we're looking at, at policies, the one policy which, which I've been advocating for, I'm advocating for here right now, and I've advocated in the UK and in the US, in addition to what all the other military strategies and so on, is a policy of going after the individuals who hold his money for him. And, and my voice has, has gotten through in the UK and it's gotten through in the US and both countries have made statements in the last 10 days to say that they would sanction oligarchs looking after Putin's money. And it's very interesting because the statement that was made by the British Foreign Secretary Liz Truss on Sunday, last Sunday, um, moments after that statement was made was the first time that Vladimir Putin emerged to publicly discuss the situation in Ukraine. He had been hiding effectively, not saying a word about Ukraine for the previous month. And he finally came out because we finally hit his Achilles heel. And so as we look forward um, as to what to do about this situation, my prescription is to make a list of the 50 oligarchs, the 50 biggest oligarchs um, who look after Putin's money. And there's a mystery as to who these people are. Various people like Alexei Navalny, the opposition leader who's in jail, um, and many others have, <clears throat> have made this, uh, this list. And we hit these people um, with Magnitsky sanctions. We start with five before, um, before any invasion to show Putin we're serious. Um, we then tell him he's got 10 days to pull back from the border. We hit them or we hit them with another five. And if he invades, we go after the, the rest of the 40. I believe that this would stop Putin in his tracks and he wouldn't invade Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank all our witnesses for their opening statements. We will now go to questions by members. And uh, the first set of uh, rounds will be, there'll be four of them. It will be six minutes each. Uh, and the floor first goes to Mr. Morantz. Please go ahead for six minutes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my first, uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, my first question is uh, to Mr. Browder. But before I get into my question, I just want to say um, I had the opportunity to read Mr. Browder's book, uh, Red Notice. I recommend, I recommend it to every member of this committee. Um, it is an eye-opening account of the brutality of the uh, Russian regime under Vladimir Putin, and it is an homage to Mr. Browder's um, friend and lawyer, Sergei Magnitsky. Um, I commend you for writing the book and doing all the work that you've done, uh, Mr. Browder. The first question is, um, uh, I just want to get your, your view or opinion on uh, the current Canadian government's uh, record, its current record on the use of the Justice for Victims of Corrupt uh, of, uh, Foreign Officials Act or the Magnitsky Act. Uh, what do you think of uh, the track record of the Canadian government to date? So, um, can I speak, or is it, or is there um, more more questions? Right. Uh, you have, you uh, you can answer that, and then I, I probably will have uh, okay. yeah. some follow up okay. questions. Okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so the Canadian Magnitsky Act was passed in in December. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, November of 2017, and I thought it would be a huge uphill struggle to get um, people actually on the list, but about 10 days after it was passed. Um, the Canadian government sanctioned the people who killed Sergei Magnitsky, the people involved in the murder of Jamal Khashoggi, some uh, um, uh, Venezuelan bad guys, and, and some of the officials from Myanmar who were involved in the Rohingya genocide. And I thought that, that this was uh, a really good sign, and, and Canada was off to uh, world leadership in this, in this sphere. Uh, there was one more um, round of sanctions, and then from 2018 until now, the Canadian Magnitsky Act has not been used. And I, I would, I look at this and I'm quite um, frustrated and, and um, disturbed by this because it's inconsistent with how I viewed Canada when I was going through the 
advocacy process. And it, it's unhelpful um, in the world if we're um, in a situation where sanctions should be done multilaterally when the United States and UK and other countries do that, Canada should join. And there's a number of instances where other countries sanction um, very despicable people doing terrible things and Canada doesn't, doesn't um, join its allies. And I think that it should, and I think that this needs to be addressed going forward. Uh, thank you. And, you know, we've had, um, I, well, firstly, I know you've described uh, Magnitsky sanctions as, uh, uh, just paraphrasing, an Exocet missile directed right at the heart of um, the Russian oligarchs and Mr. Putin. Um, a very uh, targeted and specific sanctions, which is why I'm somewhat confounded. We've had global affairs officials before uh, this committee, and they seem reticent to uh, commit to using this legislation, but rather to fall back on the more general legislation uh, with respect to um, sort of broad state-based sanctions. And I'm, I'm wondering, like, if you have any sense of why they might uh, be leaning in that direction as opposed to using your uh, very effective idea. Well, I, I can't get inside the head of the officials inside the um, Canadian um, Global Affairs Department, but um, what I can say is is that it's um, uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of people in the world um, on the on the on the ledge on the bad side of the ledger who don't like Magnitsky sanctions. It's it's a it's a real. Um, uh, uh, black mark for somebody to be put on a Magnitsky list, and perhaps it's an easier, less um, uh, less controversial sanction to use. But I think that question is probably best addressed to the people who have been reticent about using it to understand what their thinking is. Uh, fair enough. Um, now there have also been discussions in, in uh, media about the use of um, what's called the economic nuclear option, uh, cutting Russia off from the uh, SWIFT system, the global economic payment system. I just wanted to get your opinion on on that as a potential sanction as well. Well, so, so the way I look at it is is that um, <clears throat> that is the, that is truly the nuclear option. Uh, when that was used against Iran, it basically pushed Iran back to the Stone Ages from an economic perspective. And, and the question we have to ask ourselves is, um, should we use such a blunt instrument as a, as a first choice, or should that be the last possible choice? Because it affects everybody in Russia, many of whom are just as much a victim of Vladimir Putin as Ukraine is, as Ukraine is and as we are. Um, and furthermore, there's all sorts of economic repercussions that will happen in the West. If we, if we don't allow Russia to use the bank payment system, how does Germany pay for its gas? And so uh, I, I think that, that, that the, if we have another tool, <laughs> which avoids all this collateral damage, it goes straight to the heart of the decision-making system. It avoids hitting Russians, it avoids hitting ourselves. That should be used and it should be used aggressively first. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bradder. Now uh, to Mr. Kolga, uh, time permitting. Uh, Mr. Kolga, Ukraine has requested lethal defensive weapons from uh, the Trudeau government. Um, many of our democratic allies, including the U.S. and the U.K., have granted this request and supplied these weapons. Uh, why is it that? Why do you think there is this reticence within the Canadian government to provide the lethal aid that Ukraine needs to fend off Russian aggression? Just a brief answer, please, Mr. Kolga. Just in the interest of time. Well, the, I can give a very brief answer. Um, uh, thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. I, I, I believe that you'd have to ask the, the Canadian government that question as to why they, they have not sent, uh, have decided against uh, sending lethal weapons to, to Ukraine. As you mentioned, uh, the United States, the UK have Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, which are very close to the border and on the front line with Russia. They've decided to send uh, lethal weapons. So it would be good if Canada coordinated with them and, and did the same. Uh, merci beaucoup, Monsieur Morantz. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Bandayan. You have the floor for six minutes now. Inaudible. Ms. Bandayan is on mute. I believe you are on mute, Ms. Bandayan. Very sorry, indeed, I was. The pleasures of Zoom. Thanks very again to the witnesses. Deep, deep respect for your work. 
Um, I have a number of questions um, for all of the witnesses. So to the extent that you can make your responses brief, I would appreciate it. Um, Mr. Browder, how many countries have imposed Magnitsky sanctions since uh, Russia um, increased uh, it, its troops at the border of Ukraine? At the moment, Magnitsky sanctions have not been used um, on the, uh, for this particular issue um, since since Russia has put their troops on the border. And and do you believe that Canada should uh, go out on its own? I, I understand that uh, the UK and the US have uh, have indicated that they uh, may one day look to this. Just uh, by the way, as our foreign affairs minister uh, Jolie said that Russia would face, and I, I quote, severe sanctions if it makes further moves against Ukraine. So I guess my question is, would sanctions have the same bite and the same deterrent effect uh, should Canada um, impose them on its own at this point? My recommendation is that Canada joins its allies, the United States and, and the UK, in, in sanctioning and proposing sanctions for Russian oligarchs. I've heard, the, I've heard this terminology, heavy sanctions, coming from the um, Canadian foreign minister, which sounds good as a headline, but I think that she should add the word, um, and specifically, we're going to look at sanctioning oligarchs close to Putin. Those are the words that were said by the British Foreign Secretary and um, by by President Biden, and I think it would have a, a very strong impact if Putin saw that that all the allies were working together and the, and there was no division in the sanctions or the language of the sanctions. Why well, haven't the UK and the US done so already? I believe that that at the moment that they're looking at sanctions, the threat of sanctions as a deterrent. Although, as I said in my opening remarks, I think that there should be some small a taste of the sanctions, because at the moment, Putin doesn't believe that any of us are serious about this. And until he sees that there's some seriousness, um, his calculation is that this will be like every other thing he's done, where there's been sanctions, but none that affect him personally. Thank you. Um, my, my next question is, uh, I think I'll address it to the Ukrainian Canadian Congress. Um, good afternoon. I, I'm looking at a photo here uh, uh, published uh, on um, pu publicly on February the 2nd. It is a photo of um, Ukrainian uh, MPs holding up uh, flags of different countries uh, in, in their parliament. And I see the Canadian flag uh, front and center. Could you give us a bit of background um, uh, re regarding this photo? I, I understand that it, 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 it represents the countries that have helped the Ukraine the most. Uh, I've seen the photo published as well. I, I believe there was a moment in the Ukrainian parliament where uh, some, I don't know which exact deputies, but some deputies had uh, had organized that photo op. So uh, I believe they were making reference to the Operation Unifier uh, assistance that had been announced as well as uh, other uh, aid from other countries represented there. My understanding from our defense minister, Anand, is that Canada has uh, currently um, 260 troops on the ground uh, today in Ukraine conducting uh, tra training missions under uh, Unifier, which you, you've just referred to. Is there any country that has more troops uh, on the ground at the moment? I, I don't have an operational analysis of the American or uh, British uh, uh, operations, but I know that Canada has traditionally been one of the largest uh, contingents there. I think uh, our main concern is, as, as good as Operation Unifier is, for their own safety, those troops will be evacuated as soon as an invasion begins, and that's, uh, I think, the proper thing to do. I believe the UK has um, just over 100 troops in the United States, um, about 150. Do those numbers sound correct to you? I, I don't have any numbers on the other uh, country missions, so I'm sure they're correct. You. And, and perhaps I'll turn uh, to, to Mr. Kolga. I found it uh, very interesting what you had to say about um, cognitive warfare and, and, the, and the amount of disinformation coming out of Russia. I wonder if you can enlighten us and, and Canadians as to how uh, Russian disinformation is entering um, you know, Canada at the moment through, through which uh, platforms or, or um, I, you know, mechanisms, uh, uh, Mr. Kolga? Well, thank you for so, so much for the question, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, th there are several different ways that uh, Russian disinformation enters into uh, Canadian, Canada's 
information space. Um, one of the primary methods is through RT. This is a uh, Russian state-owned news channel uh, that's been broadcasting since 2005. It, um, it broadcasts what uh, you, know, you could call news, but much of the vast majority, in fact, um, is Russian state propaganda aimed at advancing its, uh, its interests. Um, there are other uh, state media channels that are also um, pushing the sort, same sort of information into Canada. Uh, there's also a, uh, a system of proxy websites, fake news websites, um, uh, con uh, websites that promote conspiracy theories and such, many of which have been uh, identified in reports that I've produced at, in dis at Disinfo Watch. Uh, the State Department has also produced them. One of them is a, 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 a platform called Global Research, uh, which was identified by the State Department uh, last year. Um, these, uh, all of these platforms have been active over the past two years promoting uh, COVID conspiracy theories, uh, vaccine hesitancy and such, um, and have been uh, picked up by sometimes by by some mainstream media, some extremist media, uh, in efforts to uh, to to as they they're pushing them in the in the in uh, to Canadians, um, and uh, and so that's it's primarily Russian state media that that promotes these uh, these narratives. Mr. Kolga, thank you very much. We'll, we'll have to leave it there in the interest of time. Merci beaucoup, Madame Bendayan. Thank you very much, Ms. Bendayan. Uh, Mr. Bergeron, you now you have the floor for six minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank our witnesses for being with us today. And I'm going to continue on the same lines as Ms. Bendayan. I'd say, Mr. Kolga, that first of all, I agree. It seems undeniable, indeed, that Russia is carrying out disinformation campaigns around the world, particularly in countries, Western countries. We saw in Germany uh, that they banned the broadcasting of that station that you were just referring to a few moments ago. And I'll admit that I was somewhat surprised to hear you say That you, do you presume that the occupation of downtown Ottawa could flow from Russian action? I must say to you that the last time I heard something as spectacular uh, as, as that is when this committee was the um, victim of uh, someone uh, that who. who Plus himself off as a Russian cabinet minister. They were we were fooled. Now you referred to a list of people that we should impose sanctions on under the Magnitsky Act. But um, this impersonator of Mr. Volkov uh, implied that uh, the Kremlin was uh, f fueling the separatist movement in Quebec. So I I, I was gobsmacked to hear this. So when you are listening, when to hear you talk about Russia being behind this occupation of downtown Ottawa, um, <laughs> I'd like to hear what you base this on to make such an, a statement. It's so uh, unexpected is the least I could say. Uh, allow me to clarify. I don't believe that Russian state media is behind this, uh, the protests, but I do believe that Russian state media and other foreign media possibly uh, are exploiting the situation. What Russian state media and the Kremlin tries to do, they, they identify uh, very divisive uh, issues. And what they do is they exploit them in order to further divide Western societies. Um, what we've observed over the past week is that uh, RT, Russia Today, has been reporting positively on the protests. Um, we've seen other proxy platforms doing the exact same. Um, this uh, legitimizes them and, and could perhaps help fuel them along. But it's, it would be incorrect to say that Russian state media is behind the protests. Um, they just exploit them. Merci. Merci. Thank you for that clarification. I think it was important. Uh, I'd like now to ask a question of Mr. Mikhail Sitchin from the Canadian-Ukrainian Congress. You also seem, and you mentioned it in your opening presentation, giving credence to the theory that there is an 
imminent new invasion of Ukraine by Russia. The Minister of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine, Mr. Kuleba, has asked to us to not contribute to this escalation and through alarmist stories and talking about an imminent invasion because that would undermine Ukraine's interests. And through this, we're playing Russia's game. And the Ukrainian president was saying the same thing, saying that there was no reason to state that a major invasion is being prepared. And so why, whereas Ukrainian authorities themselves are asking us to uh, calm down the rhetoric, what are you relying on exactly? What facts are you relying on? It, it seems that it, in a sense, comes out of nowhere. The Russian troops have been on the border of Ukraine for months now, so why this theory of a new imminent invasion of Ukraine by Russia? Well, thank you for the question. Uh, I, I base that assessment on the, the public uh, intelligence data that the American government is, is making known in terms of uh, the, the total number, which I believe might even be 140,000 uh, Russian troops around Ukraine and Belarus and Russia and Crimea, occupied Crimea. Uh, I think we have to understand that the best indicator of future behavior is past behavior. And in the case of Vladimir Putin, uh, he has said on many occasions he had no plans to invade Ukraine. He had no plans to invade Crimea. He had no plans to invade Georgia. So I, I think it would be uh, it would be foolish for, for us in Canada and in the West and NATO allies to uh, assume that Putin has 140,000 troops uh, roaming around uh, you know the borders of Ukraine with no malintention. Uh, so I, I would respectfully uh, say that uh, we should be concerned about the numbers and uh, the the rhetoric of the Ukrainian government. I think is meant to calm fears and economic uh, panic uh, of its citizens. Yes, we may see. Of course, but if the Ukra if Ukraine is asking its allies to use calmer language, why do you think? that we shouldn't respond to that request on their parts? Well, I, I don't know uh, what calmer language can be used to describe a, a potential invasion uh, other, to, other than to keep, keep repeating the facts. Uh, I know that the Ukrainian government is you know, facing economic pressures and uh, there are significant uh, preparations in Ukraine in terms of civilian and defense uh, potential scenarios, as well as with the UN on humanitarian and refugee scenarios. So I think it is only responsible to uh, to forecast, uh, you know, the, the possible invasion scenarios and prepare for them. It would be irresponsible to to uh, pretend that um, the threat is 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 minimized and that uh, you know we could be caught off guard as we have in, in many other times by by Putin. Thank you so much. We'll have to leave it there. Merci beaucoup, Mr. Bergeron. Thank you very much, Mr. Bergeron. Location goes to Ms. McPherson. Please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I also would like to thank all of the witnesses who have joined us today. I've, I've learned a great deal today. I've learned from, from all of you before before today. So, so thank you for sharing your expertise with us all. Uh, it's very, very important and a very pressing issue. I did want to follow up on some of the, the questions that my colleague from the block has asked about the disinformation that the Russian media is, is using to cause um, or to increase the, the conflict that's happening in Ottawa and in other areas around Canada with the convoys right now. Um, so I would like to ask if I could, Mr. Kolga, you know, this week we've seen a former Ontario Conservative MP in the Ontario legislature interview with Russia Today about the occupation of Ottawa and spreading some very disturbing messages. He said that Russia News provides a platform for objective journalism where Canadian mainstream media creates fabrications. So this is, this is an MPP, an Ontario MPP, that is actually saying that Russian News is objective, um, Canadian mainstream media is fabrication. Um, as as parliamentarians, what do we do about this spread of propaganda and misinformation? 
Um, well, thank you very much for the question. Um, I was also surprised to, to see that that Ontario MPP appeared on on Russia Today. I, I think it's it's the first instance of a an elected Canadian official appearing on Russian state media. Um, the fact that um, that same MPP tweeted that uh, Russia Russian state media was more trustworthy than Canadian media um, was was also quite surprising and and, and disappointing. Um, first of all, tweeting that sort of a comment exposes his followers directly to Russian cognitive warfare. Um, it sends them into a, a down a rabbit hole uh, where facts no longer matter. Uh, I think there's, I mean, there's, the, those followers probably are having challenges with some of that already. And, um, and that tweet doesn't help in that regard. Um, you know, I, I I've been warning about this, quite frankly, this problem since before 2014, um, when the when the pandemic began, um, we saw the types of narratives that I think we're seeing right now connected with the protests. We saw them emerging already two years ago. Uh, we were warned by the European External Action Service that Russia would be exploiting uh, COVID and would be using it to divide us and polarize us. Um, we've been seeing this all along and now we're seeing the results of that to a certain degree. And, and much of that is organic. There are, are genuine frustrations in society. Mm -hmm. um, and, but this is, these are the types of frustrations, the, the, uh, the emotions that uh, the Russian government, like I said earlier, exploits in order to further divide us. Um, mm -hmm. That is the primary uh, objective of Russian state media is to divide and polarize and undermine democracy. Uh -huh. um, during this process, I mean, there's we can put a stop to this. This means, as I mentioned earlier, uh, setting up a task force uh, to address this, uh, placing sanctions on Russian state media so that they're not allowed to use our airwaves to broadcast their information. Right now, RT is available on on uh, Canadian cable systems, Russian language state media is, uh, so is Chinese and uh, Chinese state media. We should be looking at all of these and cutting them off and limiting their opportunity to uh, to affect uh, to Canadian political debate. Yep. Thank you so much. Well, and I and I do I have so many questions for all three of you, but I do want to ask some questions of the Ukrainian Canadian Congress. First of all, I I, I do want to just express my my. I'm so sorry what happened with the bakery in, in Canada. I'm so sorry of all the examples that we've seen that the that have shown hate towards the, the Ukrainian community. Um, I, as somebody who lives in Edmonton with a very, very large Ukrainian population, will always stand with the Ukrainian Canadian population. And you have my deep sympathy for, for what you and what people in Ukraine are going through. But I did want to ask, you know, you're you're talking very much about doing sanctions, doing um, actions right now before Russia has has um, further invaded into Ukraine. And you've given us some rationale for why that is the case. What is the risk there, though? You know, what is the risk of of undermining our de-escalation and our diplomacy efforts if we are seen to be ramping up um, arming arming um, Ukraine you know what are what are the risks there if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit of information on that thank you thank you for your uh, your sentiments and I know that uh, you had had a chance to speak with mr. Jasnowski and I know that's very much appreciated I mean I think we're we're seeing a, a situation where uh, Putin is engaging in bad faith diplomacy. Uh, he's making outrageous demands about what he wants. He wants to rewrite the borders of Europe to his liking. Uh, this is not uh, the kind of person with whom, whom you can engage in real uh, negotiations. And the negotiations he wants, frankly, would involve uh, Ukrainian sovereignty and independence being negated. And it's it's on his path to the back to the USSR uh, roadmap. So I think that... Uh, I don't want to uh, make light of any Canadian military contributions, but I think the U.S. and the U.K. have the most significant military, uh, you know, in NATO, along with France and Germany, and certainly, you know, a Canadian contribution, I think, is is meaningful, uh, but it needs to be put in perspective of, you know, I think for two weeks now, we've had those other, uh, other powers sending defensive missiles and things, so I think uh, we're very much urging Canada to, to join our allies in this effort. I don't think uh, can Canadian uh, decisions would put us in some more significant risk than we have been already. And and the sanctions, again, you're looking for those sanctions to be implemented now, not implemented later, not wait until, until further um, invasion by Russia, but to have that happen now. 
I think, as Mr. Browder said, Putin doesn't take these threats of sanctions very seriously. Uh, and so I think giving him a show of what this impact would be uh, is is uh, significant and different. Uh, we've seen that he he frankly laughs at the sanctions that are placed on him and his officials in other situations, and, and they haven't made a significant impact in the past. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. McPherson. Uh, we will now go into our second round uh, of questions, uh, starting us off with two rounds of five minutes each. Uh, members, please keep in mind that we will likely not get through the entire second round as we do have a second panel that's waiting for uh, for its testimony. But we will start with Mr. Chong, uh, please, for five minutes. The floor is yours. Uh, Thank uh, you. Uh, uh, <clears throat> wait, uh, point of order. Yes, Mr. Bergeron. I'm trying to understand what you're saying there. Are you saying that there will be fo two five-minute rounds for the government and opposition, but not to us? No, I'm hoping to uh, get through the first four turns, and afterwards we'll go to the second panel. Thank you. Five minutes, sir. Floor is yours. And thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to focus on Russia's disinformation warfare <clears throat> Currently, RT, formerly known as Russia Today, the state-controlled broadcaster, is licensed by the CRTC to broadcast in Canada in both English and French. And so I'd like to ask Mr. Kolga, do you think they should have their licenses revoked uh, or amended by the CRTC? Uh, I think that the Ukrainian-Canadian community uh, has uh, collected significant uh, evidence of um, of hate-based messaging and disinformation that's been broadcast by RT. Um, I think that information has been sent to the CRTC, and, um, and I'm not sure whether the CRT is actually considering uh, revoking those, uh, that license. Um, I do know that RT is in a, in a particularly um, uh, unique situation in that where they are paying um, Canada's satellite and cable companies to uh, carry their channel. Um, they would like uh, nothing more than for, for cable to freely um, uh, uh, broadcast their channel to, to all Canadians. Um, I would suggest that perhaps the, the best way of, of approaching it right now is to place sanctions on, on RT uh, for broadcasting disinformation and for attacking our democracy. Um, because I think that having the CRTC uh, remove their license, I think that that process would be long, uh, perhaps onerous. Um, and so the federal cabinet, probably the quickest. The federal cabinet could issue a directive um, to the CRTC. Um, I, you know, there are parallels in my view between two, the two authoritarian governments, uh, the two largest authoritarian governments in this, in this world, uh, Russia and China. Um, there are parallels between their two state broadcasters, RT and CGTN. A CGTN, uh, the Chinese state broadcaster, has also been granted a license to broadcast here in Canada by the CRTC, and there is evidence that they are spreading Beijing's propaganda, and there's evidence that they are committing violations of international law by airing forced confessions on air, which is against international human rights law. I'll also add this, that in 2017, when a media uh, inquiry went to the CRTC about RT, they indicated that they had not and were not reviewing RT's presence in Canada, and despite the fact that at that time, uh, U.S. intelligence agencies had identified RT as a propaganda tool of the Russian government, and despite the fact that French President Emmanuel Macron uh, said that RT France was spreading disinformation. Uh, subsequent to this, the U.S. intelligence community concluded in the spring of 2020 that Russia had interfered in the 2016 U.S. presidential election through various means, particularly through RT, and also concluded that uh, Russia had interfered uh, in Canadian democracy by targeting uh, Canadian elected officials, in particular the current Deputy Prime Minister, Christia Freeland. Inexplicably uh, to me, uh, the Cabinet allowed uh, the CRTC in August of 2020 uh, to approve RT France uh, to be broadcast on over Canadian uh, uh, airwaves in a decision of... Uh, in their decision 2020-281, uh, 
Um, perhaps uh, you could comment on this inexplicable action on part of the government and the TR CRTC uh, to allow uh, RT France to be licensed in August of 2020. Um, well, thank you for enlightening me, enlightening me on on that fact. I did not know that uh, that that this had, this had happened. I'm quite frankly um, shocked when we have we see in Germany uh, just uh, over the past two weeks that Germany has banned uh, RT German off uh, German airwaves. They've also removed. Uh, um, uh, RT, the German service off of YouTube and banned it from, from YouTube. Um, and so uh, the fact that uh, RT France, uh, the French uh, service is now being broadcast in Canada, I mean, that's, uh, that's quite surprising. Um, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, I think that um, w whether it's the government that removes the, the license for these broadcasters, whether sanctions are imposed to ensure that they're not able to uh, profit from uh, they're broadcasting here in Canada, whether it's on uh, on the internet or or otherwise. Um, we need to do something about this broadcaster and and others like it, as you mentioned, CGTN, CCTV, um, foreign state broadcasters that that seek to um, uh, promote disinformation and propaganda on Canadian airwaves. Um, we need to we need to we need to put a stop to it. Mr. Cole, thank you, uh, Mr. Thank Chair. You, Mr. Tung. We will now go to uh, Mr. Oliphant for five minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I begin by again by thanking our witnesses for your um, engagement with us today. Um, all of the, all of you are helpful to us. Um, I want to particularly thank the Ukrainian Canadian Congress. Um, you've been persistent, uh, consistent, thoughtful, and engaged uh, from the beginning of this crisis uh, with the government. And I uh, recognize that this is an extremely difficult time for both your organization and your members. And uh, to thank you for uh, continuing to advise the government and being available when we've needed uh, to talk to you. The, um, Obviously, no one in this room, and I'm going to start with a couple of statements and then a couple of questions. No one in this room is not touched by this because of the um, uh, significant Ukrainian diaspora in Canada. We all have friends. Uh, this is personal for many of us. Um, and that is a motivating factor. But the reason this is on the top of the agenda for uh, the Canadian government is not only that. It's because a threat to Ukraine is a threat to uh, the Western world, is a threat to Canada. And uh, we will continue to uh, see this as a threat to the international rules-based order, a threat to uh, a sovereignty and the integrity, uh, the territorial integrity of uh, Ukraine. And we are taking it, uh, th there is no foreign policy issue or defense issue that is more important to Canada at the present time. Um, it's been a difficult time. I mean, I talked to Boris Jasnewski as well uh, after Future Bakery was um, uh, vandalized, and that was a, uh, a personal moment for many of us as friends of Boris's, but it was more than that. It was um, uh, an expression of what I believe will probably be determined to be hate, and also probably an expression of disinformation or misinformation that needs to be adjusted. Uh, we have that, though, from members of Parliament as well, and I will not dignify the remarks by MP ND MP Lee Gazan by re reiterating them in this room, but I also think as, uh, uh, as Canadians and as parliamentarians, we were all deeply offended. I want to go to Mr. Kolga, though, about that, because one of my Ukrainian-Canadian friends said that that statement was founded in Russian disinformation and it could be promoted or propelled into disinformation about the way in which Canada has engaged in, in, in terms of that $120 million sovereign loan and other engagements such as Unifier and the other many things that we are doing to support the situation. Could I ask Mr. Kolga about to dig in a little bit on the way Russia could have promoted such disinformation and could uh, uh, take uh, uh, use of it in the future? Well, thank you very much for that question. Um, as a, uh, a child of Estonian refugees who fled uh, the, the Soviet occupation in, in September of 1944, um, I can tell you that um, my parents, who were infants at the time, would have been considered by the Soviet Union and by their propaganda machine as being what Ms. Uh, uh, according to, you know, similar to the tweet that you were referring to, that the, they were fascists or neo-Nazis, simply for escaping 
um, Russian occupation and, and repression. Uh, that uh, line of propaganda was used throughout the Cold War uh, to smear anyone who was critical of the Soviet Union and the occupation and, and repression uh, of, of the republics occupied by the Soviet Union. That narrative has been resuscitated, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, by the, by the Putin regime to label anyone who is critical of his regime. Um, the problem with that narrative, as you might expect, is that it uh, marginalizes um, those that are targeted by it uh, with, with regards to the Ukrainian community. Um, they, the entire community is, is, is smeared with this paintbrush and is intended to silence them um, and stigmatize them so that when the Ukrainian community speaks up, um, the hope is, is that these labels will stick to them and that the Canadian government will not pay attention to this, uh, to this, to this community and their voice. So that is the, that's the core of the problem. Sorry for interrupting, but is it possible then that Russia would use that to show division in the Canadian parliament? I don't think there's anything that we're more united on, perhaps some, some outliers, than our concern about this issue. Can Russia use that sort of statement to show some sort of lack of consistency? Uh, clearly, they have uh, the. I don't. I would. I'm not sure about the intentions of the member of parliament who uh, repeated those uh, that Russian disinformation in her tweet. But uh, the fact that a member of parliament has tweeted that uh, disinformation is 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 truly. Uh, it demonstrates that the uh, Russian disinformation and propaganda is effective, and is 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 connecting with uh, parliamentarians. That's Thank a you. problem. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kolga. Thank you, Mr. Oliphant. Uh, two brief final interventions will take us to a full hour with this panel. And as I said, we have a second panel that's waiting to, to give testimony. Uh, Monsieur Bergeron, je vous passe la... Mr. Bergeron, you have uh, the floor for two and a half minutes and then Ms. McPherson for two and a half minutes. Very quickly, Mr. Chairman, a question for Mr. Browder. In an article published on... I'm sorry, I don't have the site. Sorry. <laughs> In the Le Monde, the, the, the Russia is uh, solid, and with their hydrocarbon, hydro, and ga their gas and oil reserves, and it's they have had 630 billion dollars, and people are wondering on the usefulness of the suspension of the SWIFT uh, system for them. So, what do you think about? Uh, these questions raised by people who claim that Russia is prepared for such an eventuality. The, the Russians, <clears throat> there, there, there's probably no stronger moment for Vladimir Putin than right now um, because of these figures you just cited, but also because of the timing. We're, we're in the middle of the winter and because Russia exports gas to Europe and in the case of Germany, 40% of their gas comes from Russia. Uh, in the case of Italy and Austria, as 100 percent of their gas comes from Russia, um, this is the moment that they have maximum possible leverage. And what that means is that the Germans and the Italians and the Austrians and others are going to do everything possible to um, uh, break ranks with the Western alliance and not be too tough on Russia. And um, as far as the SWIFT uh, sanctions go. Um, you're correct that that Russia has these enormous reserves, but it's it, it, that doesn't really matter so much if you um, if you're in a situation where you're basically cut off from the rest of the world financially. Your reserves will run down very quickly, and life will get bad um, in a in a very short order. And and so nobody should underestimate the um, uh, the, the swift the, the the effectiveness, or I should say, the pain of SWIFT, but nobody should also underestimate all the collateral damage that it will do. We have little time left, Mr. Browder, and I think uh, it would be insulting to add another question to you, but thank you so much for your uh, testimony. It's most enlightening. Thank you very much, Mr. Bergeron. Ms. McPherson. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And since the, the, the comments or the tweet by one of uh, the NDP has come up, I want to make it very, very clear that her tweet in no way reflected the position of the New Democratic Party. I've spoken to our leader, Jagmeet Singh, many times, um, and our support for the Ukrainian people and for Ukrainian Canadians is unwavering. I believe that Ms. Gazan has retracted that statement and, and 
certainly it is something that I deeply regret and can reiterate our support for the Ukrainian Canadian um, people. Uh, my last question though, I would like to ask, and I know I don't have very much time, but Mr. Browder, if you could talk a little bit about the, the other countries that have been using Magnitsky sanctions in a more appropriate way, that have been using them more frequently, and what you would like to see Canada do and what actions you'd like to see this committee move forward on. And I know that's a lot to ask in a short time, but good luck. Thank you. So, so as I mentioned, um, Canada has only um, used um, the Magnitsky Act um, very briefly in 2017 and 2018. Uh, the United States has used the Magnitsky Act more than 500 times, and they've used it against all sorts of terrible villains all around the world. Um, Britain has used the Magnitsky Act more than the Canadians, even though it's already only been in effect since 2020. And so um, uh, what I, what I'll, I'll make a pitch to this committee, which is that um, it raises a very, very important question. We have a tool, an excellent tool, that can, this Magnitsky Act can be used not just in this situation with Russia and Ukraine, but can be used with China, it can be used with Iran, it can be used with Myanmar, it can be used with all sorts of different different uh, places. And there's so many victims screaming for, for justice mm -hmm. where this can be used. And I think it's it's the, um, if the government hasn't been using it, it raises a very relevant question, um, wh wh why and what can we do to make sure that this tool gets used in the future? And so to the extent that um, uh, people in this committee are interested, I, I think that that um, a hearing should be held on the Magnitsky Act and the hearing should be held to bring in witnesses to discuss the best practices in other countries, um, how victims have used the Magnitsky Act in different countries and what, um, what recommendations could be made to make it a, a tool that gets implemented and used more properly going forward. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. McPherson. Um, Mr. Chair, point of order, please. Yes, Ms. Bundan, please go ahead. I do not want to mislead Canadians, uh, and I believe this is very important. I raised the issue of Ms. Leah Gazan's tweet in the House of Commons, and uh, that question was responded to by the NDP leader, Jagmeet Singh. Um, that tweet is still very much uh, live. Uh, it has not been retracted, nor has there been an apology Point of order, Mr. Chair. Sure. Um, the only reason that the tweet is still up is because she had added the retraction to that tweet. This is playing politics. Ms. Ben Dian knows that very clearly. Colleagues, I think we're getting into debate here. And as I said, we are waiting for another panel, but thank you both for those points. Uh, on our collective behalf, I'd like to thank our three witnesses for their time this afternoon, for their insights. We will give them an opportunity to disconnect. Please keep safe. Uh, and thank you again for, 